Hi, this is a Nixie clock. In this video, I'd like to explain how I designed it, how I built it, and how you can make one yourself. So let's get straight into it. So Nixie tubes were quite prominent in the sort of 1950s, 1960s. And it's kind of unbelievable to think of nowadays, but if you wanted a numerical display that was able to respond quickly and was reliable, they were pretty much your only option. LEDs hadn't been invented. Um, there were electromechanical displays, rear projection displays, some crazy exotic options, Nemo tubes. Um, all of these were either unreliable, expensive, they needed um, fancy hardware to, to run. Nixies were pretty much the, the only option that didn't cost an absolute fortune. And you could, for example, put on a fighter plane and wouldn't be affected by vibration. Um, I have a few sort of sitting around here and we'll, we'll sort of take a look inside later and I'll explain exactly how they work. Um, another misconception is that these, you can see the, the glowing digits here, that these are hot. These are incandescent like an old fashioned light bulb. Um, and obviously that they'd be burning a significant amount of electricity just to produce these numbers. Not true. Nixies are cold cathode, meaning they're cool to touch. They do not require incandescence, they do, not require, they do not produce heat to glow. They actually operate um, in a very similar manner to in fact, actually the same manner as a neon glow tube, just arranged slightly differently. Let me explain. Neon glow tubes, neon lights that we're all familiar with, they just consist of a tube filled with neon at low pressure. Um, putting a high voltage across that tube causes electrons to flow from one side to the other, which causes the neon gas inside to glow orange. Nixie tubes are just the same thing, arranged slightly differently. So in the case of a Nixie tube, we have an anode. To that we apply high voltage. In the case of most Nixies, that's about 170 volts. Um, that anode is in the form of a grid. You can see it really prominently in this tube here. And then there are 10 or maybe more, maybe less depending on the exact tube you're using. Um, but in these, in these examples there are 10 cathodes. Now you can see these here. So each of the cathodes is shaped like a number. You can see the number 6 at the front here. Um, they're stacked one on top of each other. So looking from above, we see the anode grid at the front with these 10 cathodes. Now applying the high voltage to the anode while connecting a cathode to ground, I mean electrons will flow from the cathode to the anode, which will cause the gas around the cathode to glow. With Nixie tubes being obsolete for about 50 years, you'd think uh, they'd be quite hard to get hold of nowadays. Um, Luckily there was one country that carried on manufacturing them up until the 1990s. Any, any guesses which country? Of course, Soviet Union. Um, yeah, so the, the tubes used in the clock um, are IN-14s. Um, the mine are stamped, I think this one's stamped 1973. I think all the ones in the clock are manufactured in the 70s. Um, it sort of shows that that the Soviet tech. Um, you can see the, the the grid. See how thick the metal is here. Now compare it to this Burroughs tube. Um, I think these these were manufactured in America. Maybe it was Britain. I can't remember. Look how thin the wire mesh is, as opposed to this. Yeah, the cathodes are are pretty chunky as well. Um, while we're at it, the one of the uh, one of the tubes in my clock, it's this one here. The numbers aren't installed um, quite correctly, that they sort of rotated to one side. Um, and sort of best of all, my favorite feature is, wait for it, wait for number five, it's an upside down two. Somebody uh, was clearly giving the impression they were saving costs by reusing the cathodes for the digit five, which is fantastic. Um, Right, anyway, enough of that, enough, enough joking around. The bottom line is, um, these Soviet tubes are still super cheap to get hold of. I think there were about six of them for about £30 when I bought them a few years ago. Um, but because of this, I'd refer to it as under-engineering, um, they're apparently really reliable. Um, like an AK-47, that's how I think of 
of, of my tubes. They might not be the prettiest. I still think they look very pretty, but they're apparently the most reliable, so that suits me. Okay, so the, the first step is to actually make a tube glow, I suppose. So here I have an Arduino. I've taken the chip out and I'm just using it as a power supply, just a 5 volt power supply. So that's connected to this Nixie power supply board. Um, you can buy these on eBay. They provide 170 volts output. Um, they, they, I can't be bothered making my own supply. These just cost a few pounds on eBay. So here's, here's a tube. I'm connecting the anode via a resistor to the high voltage output from the, the Nixie supply. And these other outputs are all the cathodes on the tube. So connecting any one of these to ground there we go, it'll cause a digit to glow. That would happen to be the cathode for number one. There's the cathode for number six. Um, should, you can see the glow a little better on this camera, actually, now that I look at it. And there's another one. Okay, great. So this is what I did a few years ago. Uh, I actually used them as, as table displays for my wedding, which was which was all rather nice. Um, but how, how do we make... Um, how do we change the number? How do we show multiple numbers? So to light up multiple digits, we can take our Nixie tube, we connect it through a current limiting resistor. I never mentioned that before, but you always have a resistor here to stop um, excessive current going to the anode. Um, now you may think we can take each cathode, each of these, these lines here is going to a cathode, you may think we can take each one to a microcontroller pin um, and we can write low to that pin, for example, um, and that would display the corresponding digit. And that would burn out the microcontroller because we were at high voltage here. So we don't put 170 volts through microcontrollers. What we need is a driver chip. So the one here, a K155 ID1, is um, a Russian chip. It has 10 output pins. Each of these go to the 10 cathodes. Then it has four input pins. We can connect those to a microcontroller. The chip handles all the, the level changing. All we have to do is write certain combinations to these four input lines, and the chip will pull the corresponding cathode to ground. So, for example, writing 1000 causes cathode number 1 to go to ground, which causes digit number 1 to show on the tube. Let's do that on a breadboard. So here we are again um, with my Arduino. Uh, this time we have the microcontroller installed um, and we're again taking 5 volts uh, to supply the high voltage output for the Nixie tube. Here's the driver um, IC. Uh, it's just connected to power and ground for now. So we're going to connect the microcontroller for outputs to the driver IC. Um, so that's it. Input, input one just going in here. Uh, we'll just speed this up here. Great, so that's our four outputs from the microcontroller, uh, all feeding into the, the Nixie driver. Uh, so now we can take the tube itself. Uh, we'll connect the anode to uh, the high voltage uh, via, via the current limiting resistor. That's on the board already. And now let's just plug some of the, the cathodes into the outputs of the driver circuit. So I, I have a little program on the microcontroller that just cycles through all of the all of the um, the possible combinations that the driver IC can take. So it should just cycle through some random numbers. So I've I've not plugged them all in here, but I've I'm, I think I've managed to get about six or seven of them connected up to the outputs. The outputs of the uh, the Nixie driver there. Okay, great, and then we can see it just cycling through some numbers at random there. So what's happening is the microcontroller is sending various combinations to the inputs um, on the driver chip, and the corresponding cathodes go to ground and light the corresponding number on the Nixie tube. Simple. So we're able to show multiple digits on one tube. Now, how do we do that for six tubes at the same time to make a clock? So here I have six tubes, anodes connected to high voltage, uh, so what we could do is take each tube, um, 
connect each of the cathodes to to an individual Nixie driver IC, and then each of the inputs could go to a microcontroller. Uh, in our case, we'd, we'd actually need a shift register, uh, three shift registers, because uh, there aren't enough pins on, on the microcontroller we're using. Uh, so the, here we are, here's the, here's the microcontroller. Um, th this isn't, isn't actually a good approach. Um, you can already see uh, there's 10 uh, ICs on, on this on this design already, which is obviously quite expensive and takes up takes up a lot of room on, on the PCB. Um, also, this would require all of the all of the tubes to be lit at the same time, which is less efficient. It shortens the uh, tube lifespan, and it could actually overwhelm the power supply. I mean, I'm not entirely sure how much current my supply can provide, but um, I'm not convinced it'd be able to do all six at the same time. So a better approach is something called multiplexing. Let's, uh, let's zoom out a little bit there. So this looks like a horrible mess. Um, and multiplexing is intimidating, I think, at first. But it, I actually thought it was easier to do this um, from a circuit design perspective than, than to not. So what we do is we take the six tubes. Now, we need to be able to turn each tube on and off. So we do that via a couple of transistors. You can see the full design at the, at the Git, Git um, GitHub repository. But we take two transistors and we use these to turn the Nixie tube anode on or off. So each of these transistors is connected back to the microcontroller. We have six outputs here, one for each tube. Then we take our four other outputs to a single Nixie driver. Now all of the cathodes are connected together, all of the common ones. So the zero cathodes are connected together, the one cathodes are connected together, etc. So what we can do then is let's say we want to display a one on this tube here. We'd write one zero zero zero. That would output, that would uh, send cathode one to ground on all of the tubes. However, we only turn on tube number one via this side. And then if we wanted tube number two, um, to, to show digit two, let's say, um, we quickly turn off tube number one, we turn on cathode number two, cathode two turns on on all of the tubes, we only turn on tube number two. We repeat that for all six tubes, we go across them, displaying the digit we want. Now that would only show one digit at a time, right? Well, we do that really quickly. Uh, we change, we, we switch tube about every millisecond. Um, you're probably aware that human persistence of vision means that that to us just looks like all of the tubes are lit. However, if I slow down the footage, we can see here only one tube lights up at a time. That is multiplexing. It required about four extra lines of code. And although this looks more complicated than this, this is a mess to try and put into a PCB. That is easy. Okay, so here's the final design. Um, you'll see it's quite, you know, it's a relatively narrow board. Um, first thing to notice is exactly what I was discussing about the lines to the cathodes. There's only 10. When I first tried to design this, I didn't really know about multiplexing. I was actually quite new to electronics. Uh, the board was twice as wide. <laughs> So it just sort of goes to, goes to show that multiplexing is almost essential uh, for making a half-decent Nixie clock. Um, let's take it out of the case. There's a, there's a 3D printed case as well. There's designs for that also on, uh, on GitHub. Now, this is the Nixie driver I see, just the single one. And here is the microcontroller over here. Uh, I, I just generally went with through hole components uh, for convenience, but the transistor's a surface mount that just helps save space. On the bottom over here is the 170 volt power supply. Um, there's, it's often said online that these can kill you, probably not. You can touch it, it kind of tingles, and it's not very pleasant. It's not going to kill you. It's powered by USB micro. <laughs> Unless there was a huge capacitor on here somewhere, I really can't see that doing you much harm. Um, there's also this real-time clock unit on the bottom. So what that means is it, it has a 
backup battery installed here, so if we switch the power off, the unit keeps time, no problem. Uh, a couple of other features. Um, every day at 2 a.m., it does this. So it does this for an hour. Um, this is called anti cathode poisoning, so it makes sure that all the digits are lit every day. Um, if we choose not to light certain digits, other ones can become dim. Um, it's just a, a quirk of Nixie tubes. So running this anti cathode poisoning regime once a day, that helps prolong prolong the lifetime. I don't think there's much else to add. There's, there's plenty more documentation at the GitHub page link below if you want to build your own. Uh, obviously any questions, comments, there's probably things I've done wrong here. Um, a a anyone that actually knows about electrical engineering, unlike me, will spot the the mistake um, on the anode driver, for example. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that one as an open challenge to the viewer. Um, aside from that, I think that's all I have to say on this. So. Uh, Thank you very much for watching.